Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're gonna be reviewing the album Fairyport by the band Wigwam. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm gonna give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. Wigwam, Wigwam, what a, what a stupid name, honestly, I have to be perfectly honest with you guys here, it's a really stupid name, it sounds like nothing, but I guess it's fine for the purposes of this one, and it's not like the name Fairyport is all that better. But anyway, here are some of my favorite bits from this album. <laughs> series that we've actually gotten around to talking about a band from Finland was all the way back in like the 100s episode something like that with the band Saima and their album Mat Kamiel and Yeramin. Now honestly that album while I loved it to bits was not your definite definition of progressive rock because it was more like world music intertwined with progressive tendencies somewhere here and there but rest assured today's Finnish band that we're reviewing is definitely what you'd call progressive of rock for sure. So the story behind our band today actually starts all the way back in 1967 in Helsinki, Finland, where a musical group, and I'm definitely saying musical group and not band because it's more accurate in a way, a musical group called Blues Section was formed and well they played the blues. And at that same year they actually released their only studio album, which was of course called Blues Section. And while these guys were pretty much an obscure band, this album has become quite seminal in the blues community for years to come. But the band blues section did not last that long and in the year of 1968 these guys disbanded. But a lot of its members didn't just want to cease creating music together so instead they reformed under the name Wigwam. Now this band actually started off as a trio and it was founded mainly by its drummer Ronnie Hostenberg. And the other two members of the band at the time were Mats Holden on the bass and Vladimir Nakama on the guitar. But also shortly just after forming they added Jim Pembroke, a former member of Blues Section, to do the vocals. Now after that in their first few years they did go through some changes, mainly with the addition of a dedicated keyboardist called Juka Gustafsson and they also replaced their bassist being Holden with a new one called Pekka Poyola. And with that Wigwam basically finalized their lineup, at least for now. And well in the years 1969 and 1970 70, the band released their first two studio albums, but for the sake of this review I'll actually overlook those two seeing as they're very blues oriented and still not with a change of heart towards the progressive tendencies. But we definitely did see this change towards progressive rock in their 1971 album being their third studio album called Fairyport. But before I dive into talking about Fairyport let me first finish off telling the story. So from 1971 the band has actually
actually continued on to perform a lot of live shows, but they didn't release a studio album until 1974 when they finally released their seminal album called Being, which I actually saw a copy of just yesterday at a record store and it was up for about like $200. But right after releasing that album, both Poyola and Gustavsson would leave this band and thus fracturing its internal core in the process. Now the band themselves did actually manage to provide substitute for them and in 1975 they released what is probably their most successful album to date, though very pop rock oriented and that one's called Nuclear Light Club, but from that point onwards it seemed like the popularity of this band was going downhill. Now just to give you some context about the time, back in the time like in the early to mid 70s there were a lot of predictions made by experts saying that these Finnish bands were going to break through especially in the UK. But despite a lot of pressings and a lot of promotions, the prophecy never really came into fruition. And well, Wigwam saw that happening on their flesh when getting less popular by the year they finally disbanded in 1978. Now in 1979, Jim Pembroke and Ronnie Osterberg would actually form together the Jim Pembroke Band, which would supposedly be this sort of continuation band to Wigwam, but unfortunately that project also had a pretty abrupt and sudden dark ending to it when in the year of 1980 Ronnie Osternberg would commit suicide after major health complications that he suffered with his diabetes. Now later on Wigwam would actually reform in the 90s and going into the 2000s these guys have released yet two new albums but of course like many other cases they never really were able to capture the same essence and experience that they had with their music back in the 70s. But for what it's worth, their best album to date probably has to be the one we're reviewing today, and that's of course no other than Fairyport. Now the album Fairyport is hands down the most eclectic album I've heard this year so far. You have these very eclectic bands that were going all over the place like Straubs, maybe some of the Moody Blues, Traffic and like that, but with all of them, despite their songs in one singular album sounding quite different from one another, you can always tell that it's the same band. But with the case of Wigwam, honestly this album was so freaking eclectic that from song to song you literally couldn't tell sometimes that this was the same band playing and I would have taken this one for a compilation album if I didn't know otherwise. But with that being said, I think that the consistency on this album has to be with the overall quality of the music. When oftentimes artists go out of their way to create very varied pieces of music into one album, it usually comes off as some of them being quite strong and some of them being quite weak, but in this one I was surprised time and time again to see how well the band were able to maintain this sort of quality level throughout all of their songs despite them sounding really different from one another. Now this album opens up with a track called Losing Hold, which funnily enough despite the band being a quartet while making this album, this one sounds exactly like a trio song. Yes, it has the ELP segregation of roles if you might call it, so you have the keyboards, you have have the bass and of course the drums. Where's the guitar? Nobody knows. And speaking about EOP, this song to me sounded quite a lot like EOP and I was thinking to myself, you know what, they're probably just trying to copy their sound. But seeing as this album came out in 1971, now I don't know what to think. And then, as I said, much like this album knows how to do so excellently, the album changes completely with the next track called Lost Without a Word. This one is a guitar plus piano plus vocals rock ballad, it doesn't sound anything like its predecessor and honestly I have no idea what to say about it except for the fact that it's just really good. Now I wouldn't be going over all the tracks on this album but just to exemplify the eclecticness of this one I'll give you some examples. So we have the title track of Fairyport which to me I would categorize it something like symphonic R&B, a very cool mix of sound but something very unexpected indeed. Cuff Cuff the Country Psychologist is just out there, it's very jazz fusion-y and again these guys were able to master jazz fusion, the R&B, the blues, everything that's in between, I honestly don't know how they're doing it. And lastly my third example has to be Hot Mice. Now if you didn't catch on it already, this is some sort of an homage, not sort of a parody but actually more making or paying some respects to the music of Frank Zappa, of course I'm saying this like Frank was dead but he definitely wasn't back at the time, but it just really sounds 
cool and the fact that they were able to achieve all of these very different sounds in one album and make them all sound great is definitely why you should go ahead and check this album. Now before I move on with this review let me change my tone completely much like this album knows how to do and well I'll state the obvious mainly for anyone who already knows this album. The production on here is absolute shit. This album is produced so freaking badly. Instruments sound like they're being puked out that are half-assedly played, but they're actually being played good. You just don't hear the good playing in most of the times, and especially in those very loud tracks, like losing a hold. Literally, the drums are just cut in the middle. They're spliced in different places because they can't seem to go through the compression to some extent, and honestly, it was pretty painful. I will admit that I was able to get over it when listening to this album, but I think that it had a lot to do with the fact that song got a bit quieter, milder towards the end, and in a way that helped the production quality sound better, if that's even a logical thing to say. But I also have another gripe with this album. You see, this one, despite coming out in 1971, and contrary to expectations, is actually an hour long. Yes, it is an hour long, and well, they actually divided this album into four sides, meaning two LPs, and the reason for it is... I'm not entirely sure. The last piece on this album is way longer than all the rest. It's about 18 minutes long, and it's basically just an improvisation that the band did in one nightclub in Helsinki in like 1970 or 1971. And it's just useless. The sound on it, if I was speaking about production quality, just take shit production quality, put it together with like recording the band performing with a micro like a single microphone from the other side of the room. It sounds so freaking bad. I have no idea why you'd want this on the album, and honestly, thinking about it, if you had just omitted that, you'd be left with an album of about 42 minutes long, and then you could have put it on one singular album, so I just simply don't get this decision. But here's the thing, while I dislike the last piece a lot because of its irrelevancy and the overall sound quality, I don't think that it's that bad and I'm gonna do something which I never thought I would do. Usually, you know, there's really good albums that have hiccups sometimes, so you're getting a really good, consistently good album, and suddenly there's this, like, one song, which is really bad, and you know, it happens sometimes, everyone makes mistakes, but I think that just lowering the rating of an entire album because one song is just bad. It's not really fun for me to do because my overall experience with the album usually still remains pretty good. And despite this one being 18 minutes long, I'm just gonna omit it entirely. I'm just gonna forget about it, I'll think of it as like the forbidden side, you just don't flip over to the D side, and I'm just gonna look at this album for its first three sides, which are definitely consistently great. So yeah, to conclude this, I find it somewhat funny at times. Usually when I talk about bands like Traffic or Family and I say what they did back in 1971, and I'm like, okay, this is just your very average blues, but people are like saying, you know, they've really gone out of the water here. They really tried and experimented and it was groundbreaking for the time. And I'm like, okay, maybe this was definitely groundbreaking for the time. And then I listen to an album like this that came out in 1971 and I'm like, are you joking? Are you joking? This isn't like something that you wouldn't even see come out in 1973. So. Yeah, you have to put things in perspective sometimes. Fairyport by Wigwam is just a brilliant album when it comes down to it. Released in 1971, I still can't believe it even when I say it. And that's, again, definitely a reason for anyone watching this video to go ahead and check this album out. So personally, I'm not too fond of this cover, but I think that I can let it slide. I do believe that there's a really interesting idea behind the cover, and whatever the idea was, it was executed to relative perfection on this one. I cannot think of a better way to create fairies going out of a very curvy castle in the clouds, and you've got the fairies spelling out the name of the, f the album, and then you have... I don't know, I just think that it has a really interesting idea, I would have done it otherwise, and it also sins in the way that it has just really specific colors on it, it doesn't go ahead and try an experiment with unique colors, that's something that you see like we saw back with Rare Bird's cover of their debut album as well. 
So for what it's worth, it's not a bad cover, I just personally don't find it that appealing. So yeah, let me say this, despite the fact that this album sounds like shit, it is so good that it just compensates for it, and for that I'm gonna give it a rating of 8 out of 10. But that's about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be listening to you by Gong. I of course wanna thank my lovely supporters over on Patreon, so thank you so much to Clay Wall and Rest of Kings and Lindsay Haycox. You guys are just the best. And if any of you want to support me over on Patreon, you can find the link down in the description or in my about page. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.